worked a little bit with it, anything. So. You did speak to us once before in this group about it. That was a couple of years ago. No, I did. I did functional C sharp programming talk. It, it was an F sharp. It was, right. it was making C sharp more functional. Was the. Oh, topic. no, that's right. The actual F sharp talks were given by. Um, from uh, from New York, Rob. Um, the couple, uh, Rachel Reese and her husband. Right. His name is escaping me. And okay. Matias came to our group from San Francisco to do a F sharp talk once too. That was two or three or four years before that. Wow. Okay. Well, y'all ready to begin? All right, let me uh, let me just share my screen here. All right, and Ooh. I should there. Can you see the puppy dog? That is yeah. adorable. All right, that's my back top. That was uh, my golden retriever a long time ago. Okay, so let me just start this up. Okay, big black screen with nerdery on it. Okay, good. Okay, well, nerdery is uh, is where I work, so I kind of had to, you know, give them a little shout out. Um, so the talk of the 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 title for this talk is F sharp primer for C sharp developers. Okay, this is gonna the the focus of this talk is to just expose you to F sharp and do a little comparison between F sharp and C sharp. Okay, um, here are my details if anybody wants to get hold of me or look. Now, down at the bottom, you'll see this link. This is the GitHub repo for all the slides and the code you will be see, seeing tonight. I mean, if you really want, you can go ahead and clone it now. It's there for you to look at. Um, I'm going to be going over some things fairly quickly. And you probably won't be able to maybe digest, especially some of the F sharp stuff. And the repo's there for you to go back, take your time, look at it, delve into it a little bit deeper. Um, this link will be on every slide. So you don't have to try and you know copy it down real quick right now. Okay. And that's the golden retriever that was in the other in my desktop. Okay. So what's on the menu tonight? What are we going to be talking about? OK, the first thing I'm going to do is just give you some little bit of history of F sharp, introduce you to it. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about some functional C sharp language features and the evolution of C sharp kind of towards a more functional approach. Um, the meat of the talk is we're going to be comparing F sharp and C sharp. OK, we're going to have some code files up side by side. This is the left. This is the right. Okay, then a little bit towards the end is like, well, why would you want to use F sharp? There's a couple of reasons why. Um, some F sharp resources and the conclusion. Now, like I said, all this stuff is in the GitHub repo, including the slides. So, you know, don't worry about madly trying to copy everything down. Okay, so before I begin, though, I had a little disclaimer. Okay, this talk is not to teach you F sharp. Okay, there's no way anybody can teach you F sharp in an hour. Okay, it is to expose you to F sharp um, and to compare it with C sharp and kind of let you make up your own mind and decision stuff. It's kind of like going to the car salesman and buying a car. I mean, you can go, well, I want a, a sedan. And then he, Say, salesman might say, well, we have a stand, but you ever think about a hatchback? Okay, you're buying a car, but there's different flavors of it. Okay, so the goal of this is just to let you look, make up your own mind. It is by no way and no means to sit there and tell you, or I'm going to sit here and tell you that F sharp is far superior to C sharp or anything like that. It is just different. Okay. So basically the goal of this at the end is, well, now you know F sharp, maybe turn your head to it, you know, make C sharp a little 
you know, Dallas there. Um, that's all the, the whole goal of this talk is to do, is to expose you, okay? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about F-sharp, okay? F-sharp has actually been around for a while. It was first shipped with Visual Studio 210. Um, they started developing it, I believe, in 2008. Don Smine started it, and then they released it with Visual Studio 210. So it has been around a decade. It is a mature language. It's a first-class citizen of the .NET language family, right along with C Sharp, right along with VB.NET. Those are your three .NET languages, okay? Obviously, most people, you know, work with C Sharp, but there's other two other languages in there. So F Sharp is what's called a functional first language, okay? Functional because everything in F Sharp is a function. It must return something, okay? It's considered a functional first language because it actually has some hybrid qualities with it that allows you to kind of do object-oriented programming style in F Sharp. And sometimes you do need this if you're interoperating with C Sharp libraries, okay? We're not gonna go into that part. We're just gonna stick to the functional part tonight, okay? It is open source, okay? You can go download F Sharp, filer, the whole F Sharp module, take a look at it. Um, it's actually been open source since I believe either 2.14 or 2.15. It was one of the first things that Microsoft uh, let out to be open source, okay? It's fully operable with C Sharp libraries and vice versa, okay? Because it all sits on the .NET framework underneath the covers, both C Sharp and F Sharp compile down to the same type of assemblies. They can talk to each other easy peasy. Okay. All right. So before we get into F Sharp, let's just briefly take a look at some of the evolution of C Sharp features that have actually been starting emerging since .NET 2.0 when Link came out and Anonymous of Functions. And throughout the year, years, C Sharp has been adopting a lot of functional type features in the language, especially since C Sharp 7, okay? We now have extension method, value type tuples, pattern matching, expression bodies, inline methods. And then now in C Sharp 8, we get nullable reference type, we get switch expression, indice and ranges. And C Sharp 9 will introduce some more stuff. Uh, the ones most people are excited about, I believe, are record types. Okay, there's a couple other C Sharp 9 features that are coming out, but those are coming. Those are feature attractions, okay? All right, so let's take a look and let's compare F Sharp and C Sharp kind of side by side before we get in the code. Now, C Sharp is an object-oriented programming. It's an OOP programming languages, as you all well know, okay? Everything's built around objects. Okay, objects can contain data, they can contain behavior, they can contain both, okay? F Sharp is a functional first language, okay? Which means, like I mentioned before, that everything in F Sharp is a function. Everything, every single line you write is a function and must return something, okay? There's no voids in F Sharp, okay? C sharp is mutable by default. We're all really aware of that. Okay. You have a property in a class, you can pass it around, change the value, you know, all over the place for the most part. Okay. F sharp is immutable. Once you create a data type in F sharp, you cannot change it. Okay. You have to make a copy of it and change just what you want. Okay. I won't go into details, but under the covers, that's not that expensive because what they use is what are called linked lists. Okay. C sharp, well, nulls are allowed. Okay. Now, with null reference types coming out, it kind of gives you warnings and stuff when you might be using something that might be null. Um, but for the most part, 
nulls are allowed. Okay. F sharp, nope. Nulls are not allowed. You cannot have null. Okay. Because everything's a value type, it must have a value. That means that, for example, you can do uh, a string dot length and never have to worry about if your string is null or not, and having to throw exception because it can't be null. Okay. In C sharp, everything's reference type for the most part. Okay. It's pointer in memory. You can pass stuff around, it can change all over the place. Um, it's pointer in reference. Okay. F sharp is static value type. Okay, everything is static and everything's a value type. So you have structural quality built right on in. Okay, C sharp, the code has no dependency order. And what I mean by this is that it doesn't matter where you declare your classes, where you declare your members of your classes, what order you put them in, just as long as they're there, it compiles just fine. Okay. This can lead to some cyclic dependency problems, but we're not going to really go there. Um, but F sharp is different. It has enforced dependency order, which means that in an F sharp project, it is compiled from the first code fi file you have in order from top to bottom. The code in an F sharp project can only use code that's been declared above it. Okay. Anything below it, it just plain can't see. So you get built-in onion architecture, okay, by default. All right. Well, C sharp is an imperative language. F sharp is declarative. Okay. Imperative, you focus on how you're going to do something. F sharp is the what. Okay. A great example of this is you go to a restaurant. And you see a table, maybe under the window, and you tell the hostess, well, we're going to go over that table. And to do that, I'm going to go down this aisle, hang a left at the third table, and then another right, and go down in that aisle, and I'm going to be at our table. And F sharp would be like, well, we want that table for two, please. Okay, that's kind of just an analogy. Okay, in C sharp, classes are used for data and behavior. Okay, um, we've all seen the POCO classes where you're in the DTOs where you transfer data around that holds data, it goes from one layer to another. Okay, we have our service classes which work on our data classes. It's very, very common. Okay, you all use it every day. Okay, in F sharp, data and behavior are separate. Okay, pure and simple. Okay. Your types in F sharp only contain data. Okay? There is no behavior involved. Okay? The main data structure in F sharp is called a record type. Okay? We'll be seeing this coming up. All the stuff I'm talking about, we're going to be seeing examples of in code. Okay? C sharp, well, we love your interfaces. Okay? We love our dependency injection. Okay? Well, F sharp doesn't use interfaces, okay? We use another type called a function, which basically, if you want to think of it, is if you have an interface with one method signature in it, okay, pure and simple, that's what a function type is, okay? F sharp, the whole idea behind F sharp is that you take a bunch of little itty bitty functions, okay, and types, put them together to build bigger functions to get what you want to have your desired effects, so to speak. It's kind of like Legos, okay? You have a bunch of Lego pieces. You can put them together any way you want because they all fit together, okay? And you can build a car, a boat, a castle, starship enterprise, however complicated you want to get, okay? Well, C Sharp has the concept of inheritance, okay? Well, we're all familiar with that, okay? One class can inherit another, and that can inherit another, and so on down the line. Okay. F sharp doesn't use inheritance. Okay. It uses a thing called open. And when you open a, another thing in F sharp, you have access to all the code in that. Okay. 
we'll be we'll be seeing this. Okay, you open what are called modules. Okay, all this stuff we'll be looking at. Okay, but in F sharp you don't have inheritance. Okay, so that means no dependency injection. You don't need it. Okay. All right. So there's some things in F sharp that C sharp does not have right now out of the box. Okay, we're going to be looking at this stuff. And this is what, in my opinion, makes F sharp shine. Okay, F sharp has what's called an algebraic type system. And this is a fancy name. Is, is this little strip in the way? All right, there we go. It's a fancy thing for and or or. Okay, you can have something that is either this something or another something. Or you can have something that is this something and something else. Okay. Don't worry about it right now. We're going to be looking at this in depth. Okay? F sharp has what's called the option type. Okay. F sharp, I mentioned that everything's a function and everything must return something. Well, sometimes in F sharp, well, you have to represent, I don't have anything to return. Okay, so you come up with this concept with the option type to represent either you have some of something or none of that something. Okay, think of going to the post office because your new alarm clock was delivered or whatever. Okay, you go to the desk, you pick up a box, you pick it up and take it home. Now inside that box is either the thing you ordered from Amazon or it's empty. But the box represents what's supposed to be inside. That's a great way of explaining some or none. We'll be looking at that. Okay. F sharp has what's called a result type. Okay. And this is a fancy name for OK or error. Okay. When you have a function, and especially this is especially true of validation, because you have to do validation in F sharp just like you do C sharp. Okay. Your function might give you the expected result that you want, or it might not, okay? You wrap these in what are called okay and error, okay? I'm really not too keen with F sharp's error because sometimes it's just not an error, okay? If you validate, for example, string length of five or whatever, and it's not, is that an error? Well, no, it just failed. I think they should have called it okay fail, but that's my humble opinion, okay? And C-sharp doesn't have this. C-sharp, you tend to see a lot of people making custom exceptions and throwing custom exceptions and validation to convey meaning, okay? It's really not an exception. It just didn't pass your validation or failed for whatever reason, okay? F-sharp has a special thing called the units of measure also. Units of measure are spe special wrappers that you can put around either integer or float types that force you to describe, usually in a units of measure, the value of your int or float. Okay, we'll be looking at this. Okay. All right. So with that said, let's go on and take a little bit of looking at some actual code. All right. Before we actually open up the code files, we'll take a look and put side by side a class in C sharp, a very, very simple class, and it's equivalent in F sharp. Okay. On the left, you're all familiar with this. You have a public class enclosed by a couple curly braces. And inside this class has one method that returns an int called add. Okay. And accepts two parameters, an int x and an int y, and then returns adding them together. Okay, and surrounded by curly braces. Now, yes, I know this could be an expression body because it's a one line return statement. Okay, but in C sharp, you have to declare explicitly, well, this returns an int, and my parameters are ints or strings or whatever object type it is. Okay, in F sharp, the compiler is very, very smart and knows exactly what you're doing. Okay, so on the right hand side, we have the equivalent of a class in F sharp, it's called a module. Okay, module 
technically really isn't a class. It's basically a container for your functions that are grouped together, okay? It, you can't pass modules around like you can classes, okay? It's, it's a container, basically, okay? On the right, we have the same function, let add, okay? Um, in F sharp, your methods are camel case, okay, not Pascal. You have X and Y. And you'll notice that X and Y doesn't have any sort of int or anything. Okay, that is because the compiler knows that that's an int and will return those two ints combined together. And I'm going to show you how we'll, we'll be looking at this and I'll, I'll show you how you can tell what your function is doing. Um, mouse over is your big friend in F sharp. Okay. All right. So before we do that, there's one last thing I want to talk about before we get into code, because I'm going to be using it all over the place, and that is the F sharp interactive. Okay. Now, the interactive does exist in C sharp, and maybe some of you have used it, maybe some of you have it. Okay. But it's kind of clunky. Okay. It's, it's, very difficult to work with if you have complicated classes and your classes and your methods are accepting other classes, that sort of thing. It's kind of difficult, okay? F sharp, it's extremely easy to use. And I'm gonna be using it tonight. You're gonna be seeing it left and right. And F sharp also has a thing called a script file, okay? C sharp doesn't have this. A script file is a code file it's exactly the same as a code file has all the underlying pinnings of a code file except it's not part of the compile into the assembly okay all right you can have as many code files as you want fsx files or script files and they just get ignored at compile time okay this allows you to develop your code as you would a code file, but don't have to worry about it being compiled, okay? Or throwing build errors, okay? All right, so enough of that. Now let's start looking at some code. So I don't know if any of you have cloned the GitHub repo yet, but the code examples we're gonna be looking at are in basic four projects, okay? The top two projects are two APIs fully developed that basically you give it a decimal and it will give you the correct amount of change or I say the least amount of change in coins from $1 down to a penny back for whatever amount you give it, okay? The one API is written in C-sharp, one API is written in F-sharp. They do the exact same thing they have a lot of similarities in the code. They're there for you to really dig in and compare apples to oranges, okay? We'll look at this towards the end of the talk a little bit. I'll talk about it. The other two projects are called C-sharp examples and F-sharp examples. These are the code files that I'm gonna be putting up and actually working with, okay? They're all there for you, okay? The F-sharp has its code files here and corresponding script files. I'm gonna be using the script files so I can change and add and do whatever. It's not gonna affect the actual code files, okay? So the first thing I wanna talk about is the interactive in FX, interactive in F sharp, okay? I wanna show you the power of it and go through it a little bit. So when I'm actually getting going, you'll kind of understand what I'm doing. So let me move this over here real quick. What I have is an interactive file, okay? In F sharp, you use these all the time. You take and you highlight your code there. You hit Alt Enter, okay? And it has an F sharp interactive window here. Okay, I'm gonna kind of squish that over a little bit here, okay? Now, the beauty of F Sharp Interactive is that it allows you to open code files 
and interact with your code files in kind of a sandbox fashion. Now, if I look at very quickly the actual code file, I can do the same thing in inch F sharp interactive. So I'm just gonna clear my screen. I'm going to highlight, and this is in the actual code file, hit Alt Enter, and I'm gonna get exactly what this function does. Okay, this function basically takes a list of one to 30 and filters them out for all even numbers. Okay, there's some F sharp code for you. I'm not gonna go in and try and explain exactly all the syntax and stuff because if you're interested, that's the whole idea of learning it. Okay, the beauty of the F sharp interactive is that I can take parts of this and say, well, what, what does this do? And if I hit enter, it shows me, well, there's my list of one to 30, okay? The whole thing right here, like I said, will filter for all even numbers between one and 30. So it allows me very quickly to fire up and actually execute my code without having to build a bootstrap console app or building a test project and setting up te test cases just to fire up the code and step through it. And okay, this is very, very useful, especially when you're building libraries. Now, if I come over here to the F-Sharp Interactive, okay, you'll notice that I opened up this file, okay? It's already opened there for me. So I can actually use functions in the code file and build on them. So in this case, I wrote a little function, give me the even numbers times two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna execute, get even numbers. And remember that gives me all the even numbers between one and 30. And then I'm gonna take each one and times it by two, okay? So again, if I just highlight, and you can't see this, but I hit Alt Enter, there's my list. And if you look at the one above it, it's all my even numbers times two. Okay, well, I'm not sure what this one does. Well, I just highlight the actual function name from the code file, hit Alt Enter, and there's the result of another function. So I know what I'm putting into my list.map, okay? All right, so that's using the F Sharp Interactive. It's very, very extremely powerful in developing new code, especially if you're using script files because you can play to your heart's content and never have to worry about it compiling and build errors or anything like that. In fact, I do all my coding in an F sharp script file and then simply copy it over to the code file. All right. So that really isn't uh, the interactive or REPL really isn't a language feature. It's more of a tool for F sharp. Okay. So the other thing I wanna talk about real quick, just and I'm not really gonna go over it is the Hello World code file in C Sharp and the Hello World uh, code file in F Sharp. All this is is basically a comparison, okay, of how you do things in F Sharp and the equivalent in C Sharp. Okay, this is for you to go back and look at, take a look however you want, compare side to side. I'm not going to go through it. It's just a reference file but I included it for you because it gives you some of the equivalent expressions and what's in C-sharp, okay? The match is the same as a C-sharp switch expression. So you can actually very quickly compare, okay? All right, so let's go on to the good stuff. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is data structures, okay? And we're gonna compare data structures in C-sharp and F-sharp. Now on the right, I have some very simple data structures, classes, okay? And we have your basic DTO or POCO, okay? A class with some properties in it, okay? And you usually use these, we all do this to hydrate from the database and transfer it up and then map it to your response object or whatever you wanna do with it, okay? We have the same thing but the immutable version of the same class, okay? Make an immutable class, you usually have your constructor there. 
and you pass in your parameters and then your properties are gifts. Okay. Down here, we have the same class, but now because our code requires us to compare objects in C sharp, we have to implement the I equatable. Okay. Same properties, but then now you got to override the equals and probably have to generate your hash code. Um, I'm sure a lot of you had to do this if you actually want to do quality on reference types. Okay. All right. Just simple, straight examples. You're all familiar with that. I'm not going to go into real big detail about that. But on the F sharp side, like I mentioned, our basic data structure is called a record type, okay? Now, here is a record type, the same thing as our little DTO class over here, okay? It has a type of person and two members. That's how you declare it in F sharp. Now, this thing right here, this type, compared to let, okay? means two different things in F-sharp. F-sharp type is a data structure, okay? It has absolutely no behavior, okay? A let defines a function, okay? So our function, if even we're not passing in parameters or anything, will give us back something. So every time you see a let, that's a function. So this function person one will return a let's call it a hydrated record type, okay? Person two is a function and gives you another one back. And you'll notice very quickly that they're exactly the same. The third one isn't, okay? So let's bring over our F-sharp interactive and, and you all can see that, right? Okay, I'm, I wanna make this a little bit bigger here. All right, so I'm gonna clear all there, all right? And I'm just going to load everything up here. All right. And I basically have loaded my functions and I loaded my declaration of my type person. Okay. You see all that stuff over here. And then I have two functions here that say, hey, are two of my functions that give me a record type back, are they equal or not? So here I have person one and person two. Well, because everything in F sharp is a structural value type, okay, static value type, I should say. Well, how you compare them? Well, you just say, are they equal to each other? So if I look at person one and person two over here, they're equal, okay? In F sharp, you have structural quality built in, okay? Well, let's take a look at person one and person three, and obviously that's gonna be false. So that's how you compare objects, or I should say types in F-sharp. Now, another beautiful thing about F-sharp is that if you change the type, okay, for whatever reason, all your code is gonna blow up, okay? And this is a problem I'm sure all of you have writ run into, is that you have a POCO type and all of a sudden you want to add an, a new property, okay? Whatever it is, let's say age, ah, control C, control V, and we'll just call this age and make it an int. Now I have a new property in my POCO object, um, but now I have to go find all the places in my code where I have this new property and maybe you have auto mapper or translator classes or something along those lines and you have to go in and find those and you get no build errors. You have to look for them yourself and add the appropriate code. So if I do that in F sharp over here, let's just add a property and we'll call it an int, okay? All of a sudden I get a bunch of red squigglies my code will not compile wherever in my code I'm using that record type. It will say, hey, you have to deal with this now, okay? 
So things don't fall through the cracks in F sharp, okay? So if I take one and just say age equals 18, okay? Now all of a sudden I fixed one, but now in my other parts of the code, I have to go in and fix wherever I'm using it, okay? Now that's F sharp way from the compiler of saying no shenanigans, okay? If you're gonna change your record type or the equivalent of a class, you have to deal with it and you have to deal with it now, okay? Your unit test will automatically break. Anywhere in your code you're, you're using that record type, it will bust on you, okay? You have to deal with it, okay? All right, so those are data structures, basic comparison of data structures from F sharp to C sharp. Okay, let's close that. And now let's look at very quickly composition. The paradigm of, of F sharp or any functional language is that, like I said, everything is a function, okay? And because you have a function, excuse me, wrong one, you, the paradigm is you take little functions and you build them together to bigger functions in any way you want to give you your desired outcome, okay? In F sharp, there's two types of composition. This is called functional composition. It's a basic backbone of any functional language, okay? You have two types of composition. And one is using this little funny thing right here. That's called the pipe operator, okay? What the pipe operator says is, is hey, if I have the output of any function and it fits as the last parameter of another function, I can chain those together, okay? The little two arrows to, to the right thingy right here is a little bit different, okay? This says that, hey, if I have the total output of one function I, and it ex, the total input of another function is the same thing, I can chain these together using this little pipe, or not pipe, a little carrot to the right. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but there's a subtle difference, okay? If I look at the piped way, okay, if you take a look at the little tooltip, it says the input's an int and output's a string, okay? And maybe I should have introduced a couple functions up here. I have a function that takes an int and subtracts one, okay? I have a function that takes an int and squares it. I have a function that takes an int and adds 10 to it, and a function that takes an int and outputs a string, okay? Now, each one of these functions, if you look at the little tool tip, if you, you have to kind of get good at reading these in F sharp, but you have these little arrows. Does anybody see that input int and that little arrow? The farthest thing on the arrow on the right is the output of your function and everything to the left of it is all your parameters, okay? So right away, without even knowing that I'm giving an int, F sharp compiler knows that. So here I'm taking and I'm chaining those together using the pipe operator, or I should say composing them, okay? All right, so if I take this very quickly and let's just clear all this, I'm gonna load this up, okay? If I run this function, okay? or I load this function, I'm gonna take what's the answer and give it 10, okay, alt enter. The pipe answer is 91. Okay, well, what I do? I took 10, okay, and I subtracted one, then I squared it, then I added 10, and then I gave the output, okay? This little sprint F is kind of like console right, right line in C sharp. Okay, pretty straightforward stuff, okay? So what about the composed method with the little itty bitty signs that go to the right, okay? This is actually different. If I look at what is the answer composed, 
and I know that the output of subtract one and square and add 10, okay, the output matches the complete input of the next one. I can compose those, okay? But if I look at the signature here, okay, the what is the answer composed is actually a functional signature, okay? Compared to what's the answer piped, which takes an int and outputs a string. This is extremely powerful because now this is a function. I can plop that function in other functions that require a particular function to run. Okay, I'm, I hope it's the best way I can describe it. Okay, so if I take answer to 10 composed, I get 91. The next little example I have here is tell me, okay, from one to 10, what is the answer for each one of those numbers? Okay, all right, I'm providing list.map, which requires a functional input to work on, okay? And it will go through this list right here and give me the answer. So if I fire this off, okay, I get an, uh, an answer for each one of the elements in my list. Okay, that's a great way of putting it. I could not put answer to pipe 10 here because answer to pipe 10, okay, or what's the answer pipe, excuse me, because that's not a function, or it's not a function signature, let me put it this way, okay? All right, now, over here, believe it or not, you can do the same thing in C sharp. Okay, but you need static classes to do this. There's an example of this in the C sharp API that does this sort of, I call it poor man's functional programming chaining. Okay, what I'm using is I'm using static extension classes that take an int and output an int, okay? Takes an int, outputs an int. Takes an int, outputs an int. This takes an int and outputs a string, okay? The same exact concept as piping on the F sharp side. You can do this in C sharp, okay? So I'm not gonna lie to you that, hey, you can't do everything in C sharp, you can in F sharp, okay? You can't, I should say, because yeah, you can but you kind of get do a little bit more ceremony is involved here. You need a static class and you need static extension methods to be able to chain your extensions methods together. And this looks a lot like link, right? Well, you do the same thing in link. Okay. You know, my collection dot where dot first or default. Okay. Select many blah, 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 blah. Those are all, Basically, what C Sharp Link is doing underneath is they're using this to allow you to chain your stuff together. Well, you can use it for your own good, whatever you want to do in C Sharp. So that's how you would do it in C Sharp. Okay. Now, with that, let's move on and we're going to talk about some things now that in F Sharp you have, okay, at least out of the box that you don't in C or in C Sharp out of the box. Okay, now some of the stuff I'm going to show you, yes, there are actually NuGet packages that you can download, or you can write your own wrappers for stuff, and you can kind of achieve the same goal, but again, a lot of ceremony, a lot of extra code. Okay, all right, so the first thing I want to talk about is the option type. The option type is this concept of some or none. Because in C Sharp, you can't have nulls, you probably sometimes want to represent, well, I don't have anything of something. I have none of something. Well, that keyword is the option type sum or none. Okay. And it is the keyword, anything on you want to put on it is called option. Okay. So here, what I have is I have a function that Hey, it's called name and we'll return some Bob. Okay. So if I look at the function method signature, it gives me string option. There's no parameters. Okay. The same with name two. Okay. 
So if I just run this, I get some bob and none. Okay, pretty straightforward. Okay. So a lot of times though, you want to unwrap this and find out what's inside the box. Okay, in F sharp, you use the match statement normally, which is the same as the switch expression in C sharp eight. Okay. So here I have a function that says, hey, give me a name, which is an optional type, and I will tell you the value if there's something in it, or if it's none, I'm just gonna say, hey, no names assigned, okay? So I've loaded this up. So let's just do shift tab, get name, and let's say Bob. Oh, well, now I get a red squiggly. And why is that? Well, because F sharp says, no, you're giving me a string. I need an optional string. Okay. So I'm going to wrap that in some Bob, put little parentheses around it. And I'm going to call my little function here. Okay. Alt enter. I wish you could see me do this. And this function says, hey, you gave me an optional type with something in it. I'm going to unwrap it and give you the string. Okay. All right. If I do none, well, no name assigned. Okay. This is powerful stuff. Okay. Now, a lot of times you really need these because F sharp will go out and get stuff from a database just like C sharp will. And of course, we have nullable columns in the database. We have to represent that in F sharp. So we just say, hey, this value from the database is none. Okay, it's not null. Okay. Well, you can do the same thing with some built in F sharp types to actually get the same thing as none. Okay, so if I get sharp prime, okay, it will give me the same value as this. I'm really not going to go into it and fire it all up, just a couple of examples for you. You can have lists that have optional types in them. Okay, you can filter on that and pull out just the, the stuff from your list that has some value to it or none, whatever, okay? Now, like I said, the code examples, all this stuff is in the repository. You've got some little starter things. You can just highlight it up, hit Alt Enter and go, for, go to town on it, okay? All right. So that's the option type. So the next one I want to talk about is the result type. The result type is a built-in F-sharp type that allows you to return from a function either an OK or an error wrapped type or value. OK. Now, what I mean by this is that it says, hey, the code that you wrote is either OK, did what it's supposed to, or gave you something that was unexpected and you want to let the, the calling function know about it. It's not an exception. OK. So here I have a couple of little functions. OK. One function says, hey, give me a number and I'll tell you if it's even or not. If it's even, then I will say, hey, OK, this number is fine. It's even. If not, I'm just going to give you back a string and say this is an invalid odd number. OK, so here we will have one for multiple of three and multiple of five. OK, we have three functions that basically take a look at an integer and will tell you if it's either even or if it's a multiple of three or a multiple of five, okay? Now, the beauty of the result type is that you can chain them together and you can hook methods that return the result type and set up what's called railway-oriented programming. This is a fancy name for saying, hey, I have a train that's going down a track and it's gonna come to the first test, if it fails, it's going to take a switch and get off on a parallel track and go all the way down to the end. If it's OK, it's going to go down to the next check. And if that's OK, it will keep going. If not, it will get off 
and go down the parallel track all the way to the end. Okay. This is using this thing called result.bind. Okay. The result.bind allows you to chain together result types and give you the end result of whatever you're looking for. So let's just fire this up. I'm just going to hit Alt Enter here. And I'm just going to clear this out. Okay. So I have a function. It's called validate. I'm going to give it a number. And I'm going to say, hey, pass it to this function that will give me the result of all that from this number. And it will bind all our result types together. So if I take validate, and I just come down here and validate, and let's do two or two. Okay, I'll enter, execute it. And the first thing I'm gonna see is, well, it's not a multiple of three. Well, why is that? Because, well, two passed the first test, okay? Or it didn't even reach the first the is even test. That's the last one in my chain but it failed on multiple of three, okay? So it didn't even hit multiple of five, okay? All right, so let's do five. Well, it's also not a multiple of three. Well, let's do nine, okay? Well, it passed the multiple of three test, but then failed on the multiple of five, okay? All right. Well, let's do 15. That's a multiple of five and a three. Well, it's an odd number. So basically what I'm doing is I have a way of chaining methods together that will either give me an okay, everything went okay in my method chaining, or it didn't. Okay, it's very, very powerful in validation. And, and I have this in the F sharp example code. Okay, like I said, again, this is all there for you to play with later on. Okay, so the next thing is units of measure. Okay, units of measure are a special wrapper type that allows you to define, well, units of measure, okay? Dollars, euros, anything that has a quantitative value of an int or a float, okay? So I have a couple, three units of measure here. I defined one as an hour, one as a kilometer, and one as a mile. Okay, so what I have here is a little function called kilometers to, or miles to kilometers. Okay, so if I want to test that out, so I'll do miles to kilometers, and let's do 10 miles. Okay, now I get a little red squiggly here. And why is that? Because my parameter says you have to give me anything that's defined as a mile, okay? This is kind of useful in when you have conversion factors, okay? Oh, that's a float, so let's do that. So our miles kilometers is 16.1 kilometers, okay? If you have code that has to deal with any sort of conversion between unit types, this forces you to give the correct unit type to the function in question, okay? So the beauty of also measurement types, okay, units of measure, is that you can combine them, okay? Here I have a measurement type called miles per hour, which is miles per hour, okay? And a little function down here called is speeding, and it must take miles per hour. Okay, so let's take it and I'll just say, hey, the speed's bigger than 75 miles per hour. Okay, now you're starting to kind of see that F sharp really leads to self documenting code. This is starting to be very readable. Okay, so let's take is speeding here and let's say 80. Okay, again, I get my little red squiggly because I have to say, hey, this is 80 miles per hour. Okay. So if I fire this up, you're going to see, yep, over here, we're speeding. Now, because this is a composed type, I could also do something like this, 80 miles 
per one hour. I could have also done that. Okay, whoops, not NH. Okay. Oh, I got it. Do, do, do. All right. It's speeding, and I put this in parentheses. And there we go. All right. So the comp composition of units of measure are very useful. If you have like gallons per minute, miles per hour, um, whatever, it forces you to give the correct units of measure to your function. Okay. All right. So that's units of measure. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the algebraic type system. And to do that, I actually want to pose a use case scenario. Okay, so we're going to take a use case scenario. We're going to develop our domain model and function in a semi real life example. Okay, because we want our code to be self documenting, documenting. We want to be able to show our code even to a project manager and have them look at it and say, yeah, that, 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 that's right. That's what I'm talking about. So our use case scenario is you're a software developer and your client is a mom and pop uh, computer shop that sells computers. That's the only thing they sell, okay? And the owner wants a little program that allows him to look up uh, his computer from his inventory based on like if it's a laptop or brand name and know right away if it's in stock or not. Okay, a customer calls on the phone, he wants to be able to say without having to run back to the back room and look at all the box labels and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so we might ask some questions of our owner to gather our requirements. You know, for example, um, what brands do you sell? Well, he says, well, we got Lenovo, Acer, HP, and Dell. Okay but I only carry Lenovo desktops, okay? So let's start our domain modeling and we're gonna use the algebraic type system to make this very self-documenting code, okay? So we're gonna set up a type. Remember a type has absolutely no behavior in it. And we're gonna use the algebraic type system with this little pipe thingy here. And that in F sharp means or. So the style of computer is either a desktop or a laptop. Okay, you can see that on the little tooltip. And his brand is either Acer, Lenovo, HP, or Dell. So we're going to build a computer that we can search from very easily in our code. Okay. So next question is, well, what kind of operating system do we have? And he says, well, we have Win 10 Home and Win 10 Pro. Okay. Now, some of you sharp C sharp C sharp people out there might be saying, "Well, this is just an enum." Hmm. Kinda. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, and a lot of times you use enum properties in your classes, and you have to choose from them, and you can, you know, filter by them and whatnot. Okay. But enums in C sharp have an assigned value. Okay. Zero, one, two, three, four. OK, and you have to do some get type and blah, blah, blah to get the actual string of it and that sort of thing. It's kind of a pain to work with sometimes. OK, and F sharp, you don't have to worry about that. OK, so let's just continue. And it's like, oh, what kind of memory does your computers come with? He says, wow, we have 816 or 32 gigabytes of RAM. So I'm going to model that as RAM is either gigabytes, 816 or 32. OK, all right. Nothing, you know, rocket science there. But then you ask him, what about your hard disk? And he says, well, I have two types of hard disks. I have HDD and SSDs. And HDDs come in 125 gigabyte, and that should be gigabyte, excuse me, my typo. Okay. Okay, 250 gigabyte, 500 gigabytes, 750 gigabytes, or a terabyte. Okay. And my SSDs come on 125, 250, 500, or one terabyte. And I might be getting some two terabyte HDDs um, for Acer's coming up soon, but I'm, I'm not quite sure yet. Okay, so let's model this out. All right. Well, the first thing we know is, is that we have two types of disk types, SSD or HHD. 
So I'm going to use this little or, okay, to represent that. And I'm going to do the same with my disk state. Okay. Now, a little bit of difference here is that I am assigning a value now to my discriminated union. That's the fancy name for an or. Okay. So that all my gigabytes are going to come in ints, and all my terabytes are also going to be in ints. Okay. So now, how do I de define that to represent the actual disk? Well, a disk is the type and the disk space. Okay, so I'm going to take these two discriminated unions and combine them with this little ast or a, yeah asterisk sign right there, and that in F sharp. Okay, when you're working with discriminated union, means and. Okay. So my disk is a disk type of SSD or HDD, and it has a certain amount of disk space, okay? All right, so with that, now we can model our computer. So we make another type, and this is a record type, and it has a brand, which is either one of those four choices. It has an operating system, which is either one of two choices, Memory is one of three choices for gigabytes. And our disk is that and discriminated union. So it is also a combination of disk type and the amount of disk space, but it's wrapped into one type called disk. And our style is either laptop or desktop. OK, all right. So now let's define and model, well, what's his current stock? Well. His current stock, when somebody calls, it's either in stock of a list of computers that they're asking for, or he only has one left of the computer they're asking for, or he has out of stock of strength. Now, this is one thing you can't do with enums in C sharp. Okay. I have in stock of a list, one left of a computer, okay? Out of stock is a string, okay? All right, this last thing right here is an interface. It's a C-sharp version of an interface, okay? It is a functional signature, okay? My computer pregnant predicate, we'll see this in a second. It says, you give me a computer and I will tell you true or false something about this computer. Okay, now with that said, we go ahead and we write our little method that he's going to use to check, our program is going to use to check whether the computer that he's asking for is in stock. Okay, it's called get stock. It's going to accept the predicate. Okay, or this is called a higher order function. Okay, it accepts a function as a parameter, it accepts the inventory. Okay, this is all of his inventory of his computer, which is a computer list. And it's going to output, that's a little thing, you can define it right there, the current stock. So the current stock is either in stock, only one left, or out of stock. Okay. All right. So let me just load all this stuff up here real quick. I'm just going to do Control A, Alt Enter, and clear this right here. And let's have a little fun with it. OK, now this is not going to a database or anything like that. So this is just a hard coded representation of his inventory. OK, I probably maybe should have called that inventory, but it's computers. This is all the stuff he has in the back room. OK, he has an Acer with Win 10 Home, memory of eight gigs, and his disk, the disk on that's an HDD with 755 gigabytes, and it's a desktop. Okay, down here he has a HP, WinPro, 32 gigabytes of memory, and its hard disk is an HDD with one terabyte. Okay, and it's also desktop. Okay, you, you get the idea. What I did is I just added in my list, and this is a list in F sharp, just these little brackets. Okay, a whole bunch of record types. If I look at the function, the signature on this, this is a computer list. Okay, now 
let's define a couple predicates, stuff we're going to search for. And this should be very familiar with you if you use link. Okay, this is kind of the, the lambda expression that goes inside a where link statement. Okay, but I'm going to define those separately. Okay, so if I want all the desktops, its types of predicate, which takes, give me a computer, outputs a Boolean, and that's a function. Give me a computer, and I'm going to tell you if the style is a desktop. Okay, same thing with Dell laptops. Okay, I want to look for a brand of Dell, my computer, and I want to know Dell and the style is a laptop. Okay, if I want all the terabyte SSDs. My function is a little more complicated because the AND translates directly to a tuple in F sharp. So I kind of got to unwrap that. It looks a little complicated right there, but it's really not. And I'm going to say unwrap this tuple right here into its parts. And where that part is an SSD and the gigabytes is a terabyte. Okay. I should gigabyte. This could be either the disk space, which is terabyte or gigabyte. Okay, I had to choose one of them. Okay, so let's take and actually fire this off. We're going to call our get stock. We're going to give it the computers, our inventory. Okay, and I'm going to say pass in the predicate, okay, of what I want to search for up here. Okay. My predicate, my inventory, okay, my current stock will be the inventory piped into list.filter. This is the same thing as the where clause and link, okay? But I have to provide it the predicate I want, okay? Once it knows what predicate to filter on, it's going to tell me, well, I get a computer list back, okay, either zero to many, and I'm going to match that with okay current stock when my list that i got back is empty well i'm out of stock if i only get one back i only have one left and if i get anything else well i have a bunch of them and i'm going to give you all the list of it okay so if we take a look we fire desktops in stock okay over here we have three computers that are desktops, okay? This one, this one, and that one, self-explanatory. Now let's look at, hey, we have any Dell laptops in stock, okay? Alt enter, and nope, we don't have any out of stock, or, or the out of stock, we don't have any computers that are of this type, okay? Now the key thing up here is that when I'm matching this, I'm actually giving back three different things, okay? But I define my things up here as a computer list or a computer or out of stock. So let's take a look at SSDs in stock, all right, that are terabytes. Well, I got one left. And if you take a look at all our results, they're all wrapped in the exact discriminated union we're giving back. Very self-explanatory. Okay. So that's domain modeling using discriminated unions or the algebraic type system. Okay. The idea in F sharp is you make very self-documenting code, not only for the next person, but even something you might prototype for a project manager or your client. Say, hey, is this readable? Do you understand what's going on? Okay, now, albeit this is a very simple example, all right, uh, things in real world are a little bit more complicated, but most computer developers coming in will know exactly what's going on because you're using English language to describe your domain. Okay, so that's an example of the type system. Okay, so let's just close that. Don't want to save that. I'm going to move this over. So the last thing I want to look at is very quickly are the two API projects that I gave for an examples. Okay. They're .NET Core Swagger. So I can fire this up. 
Okay, I'm firing up the C sharp one right now. Okay. And of course, it's over here. Okay, da, 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 da. okay get a nice old Swagger API. And I can try this out. And let's put in 1.56, execute it. And my response is, well, you get one silver dollar, one 50 cent piece, one nickel and one penny. Okay, all right. Now you'll notice if I put in a negative amount that I get a bad request saying, hey, your amount can't be less than zero. And same thing if I make a, a decimal bigger than the max allowed for an integer, okay? That's the C sharp one. The F sharp one is exactly the same, okay? As far as the UI, you fire that up. So if we look at our structure of our C sharp code here, it's pretty self-explanatory. I have a controller that has one endpoint. Okay, I'm using a controller base to determine okay what result I'm going to give back. Okay, I'm not going to go into this in a bunch of detail. Um, you can digest this later on if you want. My domain are my models. Okay, and my response I'm giving back, and you'll notice that I also have a model base that has a couple things in it. It has an enum. Uh, here I am using an enum to kind of describe the result of my operation. Okay. And what I mean by that is if I go here and I hit F12, I get an OK, fail, or error. Okay. And my amount validation of those is, well, negative amount, exceeds amount, and is valid, okay? So the meat of this is in your optimal coin service, straight service class, okay? That's going to be called from the controller, okay? First thing I do is validate it. And then you can dig into this code later on, okay? All it does is basically validate for negative or greater than the int max value and sets the enum accordingly if it fails, okay? So if either one of two comes back with these enum results, I just simply bail out, return a new model with the operations to fail and with whatever message it is, uh, max amount or can't be less than zero. If it passes, okay, well, I go to calculate our amount. Okay, that's over here in a static class. Okay. And basically what this does is I use the piping trick that I showed you before. Okay. I have a static extension method here that in this case, the input's a tuple. Okay. And the output, okay, is also a tuple of the same thing. So basically what this method does is it takes an original mount and the coin you want to do it. It calculates how many coins are in that amount, okay? And it switches on that and sets number of coin in your coin model here, all right? And then returns the remaining amount after you subtracted your, your like one silver dollar from dollar 56 would be 56 cents. And then the coins. Okay, the coins are your basically, it's a DTO. All right, that's what that does. So here I actually do that functional thing. So first the silver dollar, and then the half dollar, then the quarter, dime, blah, 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 blah. And at the end, I get a hydrated DTO mount object of how many coins belong to each property. Okay, like I said, you can go digest this however you want later on. That's the approach I took. Um, remember, this is just an example, you know, um, it's not production code or anything like that, but it's to show you the demonstration of the difference between F sharp and C sharp. Okay, so if we take a very quick look at our F sharp code, we notice that's a little bit different. Here, I only have two files in here, okay? I have my domain, which has the outermost layer, my 
responses that I'm going to give to the outside world. Okay. I define my types I'm going to be using. Okay. Right here. And now remember, this code can't see anything except for stuff above it. It is the outermost of your onion layer. Okay. Then I have one code file that is wrapped in the optimal coins. All right. And I'm just going to collapse this real quick. And it itself has other containers in it, but it's all self contained in your optimal coins actually module or big global container. Okay. Here I have a structure. Okay. I created my own structure for my validation. Okay. And I took the OK error and I basically I just renamed it to something a little more self self-explanatory for my purposes. Don't worry about it if you don't quite understand it. And you know, that's just how I did it. Okay. I have my validation module. Okay, that goes in and takes the amount and will validate it. And here I'm giving back a discriminated union of either a negative amount failure or exceeds amount of failure. This right here is the validator method. And if you look at the signature of it, it looks kind of complicated, but it's set up says, hey, you give me anything, just as long as it outputs a Boolean, and you also give me a failure, whatever it is, and an amount, and I'll give you a result of whatever generic types you give me, okay? This is an example of a higher order reusable fun uh, function. So basically, I do the same thing like as I did before. I validate it by piping in with the bind. Okay, the amount negative, which takes an amount and calls the validator amount on it and says, hey, if it fails, I get a negative amount failure. Okay. It's a little more complicated than our example before, but it's basically the same. The calculate method. Now, this one actually is almost exactly like the C sharp one. Okay. A um, couple subtle differences. Um, I assign the value to a function for each one of the coins. Okay. My initial coin is a record type of coin. My calculate coin amount basically does the exact same thing. Okay, but each one of these is a function in itself. Okay, but the only difference is there's a very powerful function in F sharp called fold, which basically does your static piping for you. It maps on a list and will go in and apply a function to everything in that list. Okay, I'm that's about the best way of, of explaining it. So my coins list for each one of my coins, as I go through, I'm gonna call fold for each one, call this method. And this method kind of returns a running total of, of what I want. And this is also a tuple right here, this little comma, okay? At the very end, I just want the coins, okay? My result, is just a module that 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 says, hey, you know, this is the result that I want to wrap into and return to the controller to make my standard response from. Okay. Now there is one little caveat of F sharp is that for it to serialize correctly, okay, is that your actual object that you need to serialize needs to be in primitive types. If you're using discriminated unions, it will serialize it, but you get this funny like value properties in there that kind of doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. The entry point right here, and this is kind of what I want to talk about, is that what I did is I set up a workflow process. Okay. What I'm saying here, and this is the power of F sharp and composition, is that I have two workflows going on. I have an OK workflow, which calculates the coin, sets the optimal coins, and returns the OK response with a little message. This right here 
is the whole flow I want to go through if my validation is okay. And if not, I want to hit the invalid reason combined with the bad request response. Okay. Both these right here, if you notice, has little parentheses, parentheses around it. These are function types. Okay. These give back a function type. Okay. So my response is I'm going to take my amount. I'm going to validate it. And if everything's cool, okay, then I'm going to execute the workflow that will give me my OK response. If it's not, well, then I'm going to execute the workflow that gives me my bad response. Okay. Then I'm going to match my response with, well, if it's valid or not, I'll give it back an OK. And if it's invalid, I'll give that the bad request response. Okay. So it's the same code, but two different approaches to it. Okay. Using functional composition. Okay. And like I said, if I wanted to test this, I could open up a FSX file, load this module into it. Okay. And actually fire off the code. Or if you want to do it the other way, you can always set a breakpoint just like you can in C sharp and fire up the app, hit your endpoint through Swagger and step through it break point by breakpoint, just like C sharp. Um, most F sharp developers don't use breakpoints that much. They'll, they'll open up a, a script file, load the actual code file in it and start executing it. And uh, I didn't show this, but you can also debug through a script file. Okay. All right. Okay. So basically that's it for the code file. All the codes available in this repository. I know I went through a lot of stuff very quickly and I just kind of highlighted on some stuff because like I said, the object of this, this talk isn't to teach you F sharp. It's to show you the difference between F sharp and C sharp and how you do stuff in F sharp. So why would you want to use F sharp? Well, there's a couple reasons why you might want to. Okay, you don't have to worry about nulls. Okay, you never do. Your code's never going to give you a null reference exception. Okay, you don't ever have to write defensive coding for it. So F sharp is also a very succinct code, so you end up writing less of it. And we saw the compiler enforces correct code when we tried to change our record type. Okay, the F sharp interactive, well, hey, I can fire up my code without having to fire up the app. It makes it very easy, very quick to write stuff. And as you're doing that, you're actually developer unit testing your stuff right there without even having to have a unit test. Okay, leave self documenting code. Okay, you focus on the what, not the how. Okay, and believe it or not, it makes you a better C sharp developer. I'm a better C sharp developer because, well, I think functional now when I write C sharp code. Okay, and I always try and do things the functional way. Okay, and with that, just a couple resources. If you're interested in learning F sharp, there's two Bibles basically that everybody goes to. Okay, one's Get Programming with F sharp by Isaac Abraham, and the other is a, another F sharp god named Scott Vlashen. He wrote Domain Modeling Made Functional, and he uses a very enterprise example of the domain modeling example I gave you, okay? Some online resources, you have fsharp.org, which is the official fsharp site, okay? The one I highly recommend is Exorcism.io. There you have, uh, basically you can sign up for a language track, and you work through modules in this language track, starting from very easy to more difficult. And each one of your modules gets code reviewed by a mentor, okay? So from day one, somebody's checking your code, offering suggestions, maybe saying, hey, this isn't so good, try this other way, okay? You get online tutorial, yeah, online mentorship, basically. Um, the Fable IO REPL, it's an online REPL, an online F-Sharp interactive. We have some code samples you can go in and fire up. 
and there's f sharp for fun and profit.com this is scott galoshin's big old f sharp site a site learning f sharp site um or just google do search for learn f sharp tons of stuff out there okay what i told you you'll find in other talks in other people's articles the whole nine yards this isn't really anything new okay and with that thank you so much for listening to me babble on okay i hope i piqued your interest in it and thank you and with that i guess i can open it up for some questions don't forget down here okay does anybody need me to leave this slide up a little bit um or did you guys all Justin get put the url in chat oh did he oh okay all right yeah then i will stop sharing then and ta -da. <laughs> thank you so, awesome yes i hope you guys enjoyed the talk and i didn't overwhelm your brains and if you have any questions i'll try and answer them the best i can like i said though the kind of the focus of this is go get the code yourself and dig through it okay go play with it okay compare your apples to oranges from the two api projects i did okay all right hey Steve, feels like I got it's a really question. great for go ahead um when you're doing the the computer inventory system would it have made sense to have done um like the gigabyte and terabytes as a unit of measure um you could have yes you could have okay um and there's no nothing stopping you from that but when you have the little units of measure you know they're those little triangles thingies you know that you have to put after a certain number um they're not as self-documenting as doing it with a discriminated union um but there's nothing stopping you from that the units of measure are more for when you have functions that have to convert okay now we all know in c sharp that if you have a class then even an immutable one that accepts various parameters sometimes they can get lengthy and you have about five integer parameters in there a couple strings sometimes it's very easy to mix up <laughs> the f sharp unit of measures force you to use the correct one does that make sense yeah thanks sure Yay. There were there were two things that um, jumped out at me in your presentation that I really appreciated. Um, one was the difference between the pipe and the compose. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't used the compose that much. And so I made a mental note to um, think about using that more. And also the algebraic types to make things more readable. Right. So, those are two things that I really enjoyed from your presentation. Yeah, it's nice to look, take a high level look at things. And, yeah, you know. yeah, <laughs> those are very howdy doody, hello world, simple examples that I've put in there. But this is to mm -hmm. demonstrate, you know, F sharp, there's a saying in F sharp that leads you to the pit of success. Okay, <clears throat> compiler doesn't let you do shenanigans, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't let you do shenanigans. Your code tends to be very self documented okay? Um, so those two things right there, the domain modeling and the algebraic types and the, met, the functional composition, the functional composition especially is the backbone of a functional language. The whole idea is take little functions and put them together. F sharp has two ways of doing it. Okay. They're both composition, but one is considered piping and the other is uh, people i guess just call it more composing okay make sense yay how much of the time in in your work are you using f sharp well right now I'm, my bread and butter is is working with c sharp okay my company has some f sharp stuff coming down the pipeline but it they're not working on it quite yet okay uh but i spend my hourly days working on a c-sharp project for a company called grupo okay what types of projects are you thinking of doing in f-sharp well 
they're actually thinking about building an internal website using the safe stack, which is a uh, fable mm -hmm. Elish, um, and F sharp, um, behind the scenes. It's all F sharp. Um, that'll be an internal thingy. Uh, we don't right now have any demands from our clients for F sharp. Um, at least not yet. Okay. Hopefully that will change. So, but yep, I'm just like you guys. I earned my bread and butter with C sharp too. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, going back to what you were talking about with piping and composition, um, is a, outside of uh, the actual composition of the, the functions, is there a reason why, are there any like uh, maybe unclear uh, ramifications for doing piping versus out, uh, composition? Like, is there a reason why you use piping and not use composition for everything? Is there, uh, yeah, more side effects that maybe aren't obvious? Well, the beauty of, of F sharp is that your functions are pure, so there is no side effects. Um, the only side effects you get are when you have to dip out to the outside world, like go to a database and stuff is out of your control, okay? Um, piping is used, you use them both. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain because you just kind of use one or the other as experience, but piping is used, for example, a lot when you need to change stuff together for, for validation and you want to do one after another in a railway oriented programming style. The composition is when you want to combine some functions and give that to another function that will take anything as that signature. I mean, you do this in C-sharp too, when you have an interface as a parameter into a function or method, okay? You can pass anything that implements that and it will execute that particular method. It, it's kind of the same thing, okay? Now, what I didn't really touch on is the very, very, very powerful collection. Um, uh, well, it's from the collection module, the list.map, the list.sum, the list.fold. The collection functions in F sharp are more powerful than the links by themselves. Okay, and you use them all the time. And you will take the output from one collection and pipe it into another collection method. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I, I couldn't show everything at once. Um, there's a couple examples in the code of that. Yeah, and uh, I, I meant to start off with thank you so much for putting this together. It's it's fantastic that you you did this. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate it for sure. But it, it, it seems like the pipes are more for end consumption. Like you're not making something that's going to be made. This is going to be when you're actually running through. Well, um, it, is, yeah. Piping is yeah. when you have an input and you want a specific output. Remember I showed you this, the signature of the piping example and what's the answer? And you had an right. int and a little arrow and it was a string. Okay, give me an int, and I'll give you a string back. Okay, the composition method was the same thing, but in a parentheses. That's actually a function signature or an interface if you want to equate it to C sharp. So that function, it returns a function, and you use that function in as many places as you want that needs a function to be given to it. Okay, that's probably the best way I can describe it. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of you guys use, you know, functional techniques, you know, especially if you use link and C sharp. And like I said, you know, this wasn't a comparison like one's better than the other. Okay, it's, they're different. And, you know, there are advantages to one and advantages to the other. Yay. So before people start dropping off, I do want to uh, uh, make a couple of announcements uh, about the upcoming meetings. Um, and then we can go back to asking questions if you want. Um, so next month, we have the always awesome Jeremy Clark. Um, he'll be zooming into us from uh, where Washington or basically Canada. Um, and uh, he'll be speaking on uh, C sharp eight interfaces. So we're gonna go from one extreme to the other of, of no interfaces to um, interfaces that are way more flexible than we've been used to in the past. 
And I'm very pleased to announce now that um, the following month in July, uh, we are going to have uh, Nuri Halperin, our good friend from SoCal, who will be speaking on Cosmos DB schema model. So you ask, we answer. That's how this works. Yay. So if you have more topics, let us know. Nice. That was fast. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to that one. Nuri's awesome. So I am looking forward to that as well. Cool. Well, sorry to interrupt. So if there's any more questions for Steve, please feel free. Yay. I, I hear crickets in my headphones. So <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming there's no, but let me just say, um, the, the contact info is, you know, in the GitHub re, re, uh, repo, feel free to contact me, email or Twitter or whatever. And, and, and if you do the, uh, the exorcism IO, I just might be your mentor. And if you sign up for the mentorship program in F-Sharp Org, they have a quarterly mentorship program on the mentor there also. So, yay. That was a lot of fun. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm really excited for next month's talk and the month after. That'll be really cool too. Next well, month we will be on Wednesday instead of on Thursday. Um, you know, having combined the two groups together, and then um, and so that'll be great. We'll kind of take the lead from the Northwest Valley. Cool. Yeah, the next month's talk actually, it, it, it's. A lot of functional stuff in next month's talk that you guys will see. Yeah. Jeremy does a good job. Cool. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next month. Yeah. You Bye, you guys, and thank thanks you. again. Thanks, Justin. Bye.